after this four week pause, we will be in a stronger position because of this vaccination rollout we've been discussing. We don't want to extend these regulations a day longer than we have to. Can you give us a promise that July the 19th will be the end of it? Yes. I say, if not now, when? Basically, it just means my life is just unrecognisable. On a good day, you know, I'm able to, to get dressed. I don't recognise myself. I really don't recognise myself. I used to have long blonde hair. I, I used to be really sporty, really active. I'm getting worse and not better. And, you know, I don't have any answers from the doctors. They don't know when, like, if I'm going to get better, if this will be permanent. <sighs> Just recording this to um, remind myself about how rubbish I feel. My heart is going like the clappers. My heart really hurts. I feel really faint and dizzy. I think whenever there are policy decisions about um, restrictions and about rising infections, long COVID, we are at the stage in the pandemic where we know more about the effects of long COVID. Um, so there is no excuse really for long COVID not to feature as a really important um, indicator or factor in these policy decisions. And we look at some slides about the number of hospitalizations and deaths and daily infections, but where is the slide about illness? Where is the slide about disability from infection? Where is that slide about long COVID and how is that being factored in into the government's uh, decisions, policy decisions about the pandemic? The symptoms can affect any part of your body. They can be heart pain, palpitations, organ damage. You can develop things like diabetes, pericarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle. From headaches, tinnitus, uh, loss of eyesight, I've experienced blindness. I can't feel my cheeks. I've got a huge rash across my scalp where I've lost my hair. I've lost almost 16 kilos. I weigh like 41 kilos, I have literally skin and bones. Um, I've got brain fog. I find it very difficult to um, speak and remember how to speak um, specific words. Actually, it affects people of all age groups. Um, I've seen many stories actually of top professional athletes, um, young men who have long COVID. When my mum told me about it, I was like, mum, look, I'm 23, old, uh, 23 years old. I'm a former athlete as well, international GB athlete. You know, I know what being a bit tired is. So realistically, this isn't, this isn't gonna affect me uh, in, in any way, shape or, or form. From two weeks after recovering from long COVID, literally ruined my ability to do, to do anything. You know, I was bed bound for three, four weeks and eight months later, I'm just about able to do some light gym work because like the, the fatigue that is that is mentioned, it's not just feeling a bit tired. The estimates from the ONS point to about seven to eight percent of children uh, who have confirmed um, COVID um, still symptomatic by 12 weeks. Real issue is our youngsters because children get this as well and i think it's i think it's really important that we stop looking at covid in a binary way we're very too much focused on death or recovery and when you look at it and you present it like that like the government does and a young person like my age isn't aware of long covid you look at that and think yeah i mean my my chance of dying from covid is what 0.0, .0 whatever percent and rightly so they're not scared of that but the real thing that people need to be scared of and aware of is the implication of long COVID. People of all different backgrounds are falling ill and we're needed for the economy. We're needed to, we want to get back to our lives. We're desperate to get back to work and be able to fulfill our potential. 10 to 30% of people being frankly disabled for months doesn't just have an impact on people health-wise, but it also has an impact economically, you know, I've been unable to work for five, six months, and I'm one of the lucky ones. So there are three things, really, main things is um, reporting. We need to count long COVID. We need to incorporate the morbidity from COVID, the long-term morbidity, 
into our surveillance system because if we're not counting it as we're counting deaths and hospitalizations um, and number of infections then um, it's not factored in in the policy decisions we need our coronavirus dashboard to have an indication of illness and disability caused by COVID on it. We need recognition of people who've already got it um, so that they get the care they need, but, but really, really important to have the prevention element that we've got this massive problem and we just don't want more of it. You know, if the government admits that if something like this is out there and can affect millions, including children, then what they're doing is really unacceptable. To say that people need to be cautious um, and avoid getting infected is very, very difficult. Many people don't have the choice. Children don't have the choice in terms of when they attend school. Um, the teachers don't have the choice. The parents don't have the choice. I mean, it's not really a matter of choice. So it's good to have awareness of long COVID, but it's really important to have the protections um, and the systems in, in place to try and uh, bring down community infection as much as possible. Quite frankly, to ignore long COVID and allow it to pass through the, the kids, uh, the children population, is honestly, in my opinion, a humanitarian crime. I just want to get back to normal. I just want to, this to not be a thing anymore. And I, and I am determined that that will be a thing. I am so, I cannot be more determined. I am so determined to, to heal.